So welcome to the first information session on the production program. I'm Janine Steele. I'm the project manager for the Domestic Motion Picture Fund, which the project uh, the production program falls under. My pronouns are she and her, and we're so excited to discuss this new motion picture production program with you. This is the first production phase financing available in BC since 2003. So this is a very momentous day for us at Creative BC and we hope for all of you as well. So first off, I just want to say that I'm very grateful as ever to be joining you from the ancestral and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples. That's the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. I also give thanks to all the Indigenous peoples that continue to reside here and care for this land today. Oh, there we go. Sorry. My screens, my screens are going out of control. I apologize. There we go. Um, so this session's video may be made available online for those who could not attend. Um, so we have automatically turned off your, your video and your microphones to keep them on mute. Um, and if you do not want to be recorded, um, then we also encourage you to potentially change your display name um, as that may show up in the video. A few other housekeeping notes. As mentioned off the top, a uh, live transcription in English should be displaying. Please do type into the chat if it's not working. Um, also, our presentation, just in terms of uh, how we're going to tackle the day, it's broken up into sections and we'll pause at the end of each section for questions, um, sort of hopefully related to that area. So as we're going through, feel free whenever a question comes to mind to type it, the question into the chat. And those of us here at Creative BC will be scanning for those questions. And they'll either have an opportunity to answer directly in the chat if it's a quick and easy one, or during that sort of uh, question section, we'll repeat the question verbally and, and give an answer then. Uh, just a reminder that the goal of today's session is largely to go over eligibility and the process to applying the production program in general. Um, so then in the interest of time, as we do only have an hour, if you have a question that's very specific to your project or to your situation, we ask that you email us directly and we can catch up sort of one-on-one -on -one after the session to talk about your particular case. So just really quickly for those of us, those of you who may not be already familiar with Creative BC, this is just a quick overview of um, who Creative BC is and what we do. We are the provincial funding agency for all of the creative industries um, and we're created and founded and continually to be funded by the province. And also for those of you who aren't aware, this is your funding team uh, for all funding needs outside of music here at Creative BC. And joining us on the call today is also Ryland Friday, our programs coordinator, and Robert Wong, our vice president. So what we're gonna be getting through today, uh, we're gonna quickly talk over an overview of the program. We're gonna give uh, eligibility, uh, an overview of the el eligibility and then the application process. We'll talk a bit about how the evaluation and decision-making uh, will go. And then some notes about what happens after decisions are made, how does commitment and contracting work? And just a reminder that this information is provided for guidance purposes only. We do encourage you to refer to the program guidelines first and foremost. And as always, reach out to us if you have specific questions. So what is the production program? Our aim here is to kickstart the production of BC owned and controlled intellectual property and to help be an economic driver for production in the province. We're looking to support projects through this program that are production ready and commercially viable that are culturally relevant and engaging for Canadians and international audiences. And also it's an opportunity for us to continue to support new and diverse voices that have historically been underrepresented within our industry. Further, we wish to act as a catalyst for accessing national and federal funds for our programs and our producers. And wherever possible, we're trying to be as open as, and as accessible as we can to reduce barriers to entry that may exist in the industry. Quick highlights about what this program is covering, just a high level overview. So you can request between 50 and $150,000 for eligible scripted feature length projects, documentary one-offs and documentary or factual series. So for the production phase of those. The overall budget we have available to commit for this intake period is $800,000. And the deadline to apply is July 26, 2021. That's a Monday um, at 11.59 PM and that's in our Pacific time zone here. 
So there will be two intake periods for this program that provides a total of $1.4 million to be available in production financing over the upcoming year. So there's this summer deadline, which is what we're really talking about now. And then there will be a second intake period next spring in 2022, and we'll have approximately $600,000 available in that uh, intake period. The exact date is still to be determined, but will be in line with other sort of national and federal funding agencies and their deadlines. So likely uh, in April or early May at the latest. Now there has been high anticipation for the launch of this program. As I mentioned, we haven't had production phase financing available for quite a few years. Um, so we do expect this to be heavily oversubscribed. And so one thing that I'll give you as we sort of talk through this, something to think about, think carefully if you're really ready for production at this moment. This isn't your only chance to get in the door. So think about if it's, it may be worthwhile for where your project's at to wait until the spring and apply then. So who is eligible to apply? Again, as part of our efforts to reduce barriers to entry, applications will be accepted from individuals or companies. And so for individuals, what does that mean? Uh, our definition of a BC resident is either a Canadian citizen or a permanent resident of Canada who has resided in the province for 200 of the previous 365 days and has filed income taxes in BC in the last year. And something to keep in mind, individuals who are successful in receiving a commitment will need to incorporate a company before contracting can occur. So we're trying to be open during the application process, but recognize that incorporating a company is sort of part of the process of completing a production. So for companies, you must be a company incorporated in British Columbia or Canada, have its head office in British Columbia, be the primary and then the primary owner or majority common voting shareholder of that company must meet the individual eligibility we've just gone through. So whether you're applying as an individual or an app, uh, an individual or a company, 100% of the copyright of the project being developed must be owned, controlled or optioned by the applicant. Now there are some exceptions for co-productions, which we'll get into in a little bit. And you must also be in good standing uh, with Creative BC. This applies, uh, these apply whether it's an individual or a production company. So do make sure that whoever you're listing as your applicant owns the underlying copyright in the project. Um, and when we say good standing with Creative BC, generally you're in good standing with us until you're not. Um, it just generally means that you might have been placed in default due to previous contracting issues from uh, former Creative BC programs. If that's something that you're not sure about, um, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We can always confirm that. It's a very small list. So if you don't think you're in default, you probably aren't. You're probably in good standing. Uh, just one more note about applicants. Uh, we do not require uh, this, at this point, the applicant to be, a produce, to be the producer of the project. However, they need to own the copyright in the project. And keep in mind that if you are an independent writer or director, that viability and readiness to begin production are part of our key criteria for evaluation of who will be successful. So keep that in mind. Uh, again, if you don't have, currently have a key creative team attached, is this the right, is, is the project ready to be submitted and is this the right time to do that? But that's really up to you to decide. So in terms of what types of projects we'll be supporting, applications can be accepted from either scripted feature length films, and that's a minimum of 75 minutes, uh, and then either documentary one-offs, the minimum broadcast half hour, which is usually 22 to 25 minutes, um, depending on the broadcaster or streamer, or documentary or factual series. Again, the minimum broad broadcast half hour uh, per episode. Just a note about the scripted feature like films, you know, that includes our standard genres like drama, comedy, or animation, but don't forget that also includes our genre-based filmmaking, you know, things such as horror or thriller, or content for children or youth um, are more than welcome and encouraged to apply. Um, so what's not eligible to apply in terms of projects? Uh, so the following project types are not eligible. Scripted television series, and that's whether that's drama or comedy or any host of, uh, of others. Um, shorts under a broadcast half hour. Web series or excluded productions that are listed in the film and television tax credit regulation. Uh, and those include things such as pornography, talk shows, news, live events or sports, game shows, reality television, or advertising. Mm -hmm. 
So in terms of a project, you know, eligible projects, eligible projects must be intended for theatrical release, television broadcast, or VOD streaming in Canada within 24 months of completion. And so this is talking about that. We're really looking for projects that are going to have an impact with, with Canadian international audiences within sort of the mainstream marketplace. Um, so we're looking for them ultimately to be released in those, in those spaces. There are some exceptions for projects that fall into the ultra low budget category, and that's projects that have a budget of $250,000 or less. We will accept, you know, just a rather a, a robust festival and online strategy in lieu of guaranteeing, uh, requiring that they have a theatrical or broadcast release. As well, um, projects need to be awarded, you know, following completion, a minimum of six out of 10 in Canadian content or CAVCO, uh, the CAVCO certification process. So a minimum of six out of 10 content points um, intended at the end of completion. And projects must be submitted before principal photography is completed and ideally before it's started. Um, but we recognize it's later in the summer and there may be some projects that just, you know, tried to move ahead um, and that's understandable. And uh, this is again, because we're looking, our aims are to really kickstart and, and support new production. Um, that's why we're kind of looking at that. Just a note that pickups or retakes do not count as principal photography. So what can you ask for? So the maximum funding available is dependent on your budget level. And, the, and so for projects with a budget of $1 million and over, you can request up to $150,000 from us. For projects that close that fall between two hundred and fifty thousand dollars and one one dollar and nine hundred ninety nine nine hundred ninety nine nine hundred ninety nine thousand nine hundred and ninety nine, um, that'll be seventy five thousand. Oh great! Um, and then for projects that fall in that ultra low budget category, two hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars and under, the maximum you can ask is fifty thousand. Now. One thing we're looking at is that Creative BC shouldn't be the sole funder of, pro of a project. So for projects that are in that ultra low budget category, in addition, you can ask for a maximum of $50,000, but it also needs, to, it can only be a maximum of 75% of your overall production budget, which depending on the budget could mean it's less than 50,000. So that's really gonna affect a really small number of applicants who may have a production budget less than $66,000. It's, you know, as I say, quite small. But something to keep in mind, we do want to see more than ourselves um, in, in, in the funding strategy. And just a reminder that if you don't need it, you don't have to request the maximum, but of course you're welcome to do so. Um, also keep in mind that uh, during the adjudication process, Creative BC may adjust requested amounts just in order to support as wide a variety of projects as possible. Depends on the, again, the complexity of submissions and, and how that evaluation process goes. Um, so just a quick note, as part of our efforts to be as open as possible, we're encouraging early financing where Creative BC can act as a catalyst. And so we're not requiring any other financing confirmed at the time of application, including market support. So you don't have to have a broadcaster or a distributor on board at the time of application. Now, keep in mind that the evaluation process will take in any confirmed financing that you have. We'll take it into account when we're assessing the viability and readiness of a project but you don't need it to apply. Um, and then all proposed financing will need to be fully confirmed before we can contract. And we'll get into that process a little bit later. So let's talk for a minute just about eligible costs. In general, we'll defer to industry standards for eligible costs as set up by Telephone Canada or the Canada Media Fund. And again, if you have specific questions about what's eligible, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, but these are some of the key things to keep in mind. Um, the first is really about production expenditures and spend in the province. A minimum of 75% of the production expenditures must be incurred in BC and paid to BC resident individuals or BC owned and controlled companies for services rendered in BC. There are some exceptions for co-productions or documentary productions, which will come up again in just a moment. These must be new costs incurred after the date of application. And a maximum of 10% of the budget can be allocated for each of the producer fees and overhead. So what were those exceptions for documentary? So for, for documentary productions, a minimum of 75% of the expenditures must be paid to BC resident individuals and BC owned or controlled companies for services rendered 
but it's not required that those expenditures be incurred in BC. And that's you know, a reflection of the fact that documentary obviously is filming all around the world. Um, just moving on, sorry, to co-productions. So for co-productions, intermodal co-productions um, are what we're asking for if you're an interprovincial co-production is a majority ownership or control must be held by the BC co-producer, a minute which is a minimum of 51%. For international treaty co-productions, minimums are determined by the governing treaty. And that's usually a minimum of 20%, but would be determined in your co-production agreement. And, so, and to keep in mind that international co-ventures are not eligible. And that's usually meaning productions with a country that does not have a treaty with Canada, most notably the United States. Um, and lastly, if you have a co-production with another BC owned and controlled company, we will consider that a joint application and therefore 100% BC owned and controlled. Regardless of the type of co-production, financial and creative control should be in relation to the copyright ownership of the project. So for example, if you only own 51% of the project but are bringing in 80% of the financing, um, you know, that's something that, that looks uneven and we would wanna discuss. And uh, to the question around minimum costs on co-productions, so that's really gonna be reviewed on a case-by-case on -case basis. Um, again, should be in relation to the copyright ownership and sort of financial and creative control. If that's a situation that you're in, what we do is encourage you to contact us to review your co-production agreement um, and budget in advance to confirm eligibility. And then just uh, looking at, so targeted funding. Creative BC acknowledges that there's been systemic and historical barriers to entry for individuals from a number of different groups. So we started support for these individuals through our equity and emerging development program, and we wanna continue supporting them through all of the programs that we offer here. So 30% of this program envelope will be at minimum committed to projects that are owned by emerging filmmakers or individuals within uh, that identify as indigenous peoples, black people, people of color, individuals from the LGBTQ2S plus community or people with disabilities. So we'll, there'll be a series of questions we ask you in the application process to identify yourself in these groups. Um, if it's a company applying, then the company must be majority owned and controlled by individuals from one of these groups. And just a reminder that this is a carve out of the overall envelope. It's, it's not a prerequisite for the program as a whole. So anyone who meets the remainder of the guidelines is still very much encouraged to apply. The next few slides just apply to this targeted um, commitment. So let's just dive into that just a little bit. So uh, again, with the targeted funding specifically, real creative and financial control of the project should rest with that applicant, whether that's an individual or company that sits within that targeted group. And further, at least two thirds, that's 65% of the key creative team and that's determined by anyone in the roles of writer, director, producer, should also qualify as the primary applicant does. So whether, that, so whether that is emerging or equity. So if an emerging applicant applies, they would need at least 65% of their overall key creative team to also qualify as emerging. And an equity applicant would need at least 65% of their key creative team to qualify within an equity group. So how do we determine that? And so for our definitions are around our definitions. So our definition for emerging filmmaker that we're using for the purposes of this program is no more than one professional credit in the role you hold. And how do we determine what a professional credit is? So a professional credit, this, the goal here is to identify individuals who have for the most part not worked in the mainstream funding and broadcast world and create pathways for them into the space. So professional credit is a credit on a completed project that is completed outside of film school or a training opportunity, was financed using mainstream funding sources, and then subsequently played on a broadcaster or online subscription service and was released or was released theatrically or toured extensively through major film festivals. And in general, when we're talking about this, a project would need to hit all three of those 
qualifications to be considered a, a, a professional credit. So projects that are short, web series, or were primarily self-finance, with things like credits or loans or crowdfunding, do not need to be counted as a professional credit. This is really a guide to help you count up your previous credits and determine if you're considered emerging. So it's not eligibility in that you need previous credits to make to meet this list. It's that this is to help you determine which of your previous credits are professional and therefore whether or not you should be selecting I am emerging on our application process. So really at the end of the day, this is about a spirit and intent about opening barriers and creating pathways. So if you feel you qualify according to this, um, then by all means select yes in the process. And we will review all applications for eligibility during the adjudication period and, and follow up if we have questions or concerns. So how do we sort of, how do we sort of validate or confirm this? So during the application pr process, there'll be two questions you get asked um, and you need to select yes or no on. I am considered emerging according to the program guidelines and I am considered equity according to the program guidelines. Selecting yes to either of these questions if you want to be considered for the targeted funding. If you select yes to emerging, we'll validate this based on your biography and your web presence, including any IMDB listings. If you select yes to equity, we'll primarily confirm this through responses in our self-declaration section of the application form. So keep that in mind, it becomes really critical those identification questions allow for you to select prefer not to say. Um, so if you choose, yes, I'm considered equity, but then do not select your identity groups or the identity groups of your key creative team members, then you may be removed for, for consideration from that targeted funding. So we're just going to take, we're going to take a bit of a break there. And my trusty sidekick, Bob, seems to have gotten kicked off as a co-host, so I'm going to unkick him off so he can, he can help answer some questions. Just one second, he's going to help us out here. Bob, do you have your controls back, I hope? I believe I do. Excellent. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry, no, not so okay. So we have a number of questions um, to start. So uh, first one is that asks, uh, regarding the six out of 10 Canadian content points, is this applicable to co-pros? Uh, and again, I think that that will, certainly for interprovincial co-productions, yes. Um, and then when it comes to international co-productions, I would defer, again, defer to the particular situations of the treaty that's governing uh, the, the, the co-production parties. Um, so we'd have to look at that on a case-by-case -case basis. Next question is, uh, someone asks what a robust festival strategy is. They said they are going to get into TIFF, TANS, and Sundance. But let's face it, the chances are pretty slim. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think, you know, again, that's going to be very unique to each project. And I think we're, what we're going to be looking for there is that the applicant has a, a, has a keen sense of the project that they're making and the spaces in which it will perform well. And so that could potentially be a combination of super premier festivals, but also is it a genre piece that's going to, that's going to perform really well in genre pieces? Is it of or about particular communities? And what are those types of programs? So a real mix um, of what that uh, what that looks like, um, and that you're really thinking about what your pro project is and how it's going to find its audience. Next question is: uh, If someone applies uh, in July and is unsuccessful, can they apply in the spring with the same project? Yes, we should. We will be allowing people to do that, especially since this is the first go around. Next question is: Would in-kind financing be counted as confirmed financing? Uh, at the time of application, I would I would consider it confirmed. I mean, we would um, ultimately, for successful applicants, we'll be going through a very thorough sort of business affairs review, and so at that point, we may ask for deal memos or other um, other other contracts that sort of didn't that confirm that type of um, in kind support um, to back it up. But generally, if it's if it's in kind, it's generally confirmed uh, when we kind of make that deal. Next question is that. Can you confirm that it's 30% of the funding is going towards the targeted demographic? Sorry, can you, can, can you repeat that? 30% of the funding will go towards the targeted demographic, the targeted groups. Yes, at minimum, we're making a commitment that 30% of our funding. So for this first intake round, that means roughly $240,000. 
will at minimum be uh, be committed towards projects that are owned and controlled by individuals or companies that come from those uh, demographic areas. Sure. And that could be, it could be more or less, but that's a minimum that we want to make sure we reach. What's the turnaround time for the first round? Good question. Uh, we'll be and we'll get into it a little bit later. But at the at minimum, we're going to need about ten weeks to review applications. So with a deadline and from the deadline date. So a deadline in October or uh, July. Uh, we're, we'll be looking at hopefully communicating decisions by early October. Okay. Fine. One one other question is: uh, This person has not received any funding from broadcast broadcasters or networks but is self-funded and their project has won and was screened at international doc festivals. Are they still considered emerging? Uh, yes. And I think, you know, again, when it comes to particular situations, I'm happy to chat one-on-one -on -one just to, you know, before you submit, just to check. But as I say, generally speaking, we're going to be looking at professional credits that meet all three criteria. So both funded professionally and um, sort of screened and broadcast. Um, so if it's, if it's, self-financed but had a good you know good run or was picked up after the fact by a broadcaster we don't necessarily have to count it as a professional credit the other point to make is that it's no more than a like, maximum of one previous credit so you could have no previous experience or no previous professional credits or you could have one professional credit in that role um, and be applying for your second project and you would still be considered emerging Great. I've got two more questions, and then there's actually more than that, but we'll maybe move back to the presentation. We'll get to the questions, other questions later. Um, how many projects can one person be part of? Yes, so we are not limiting uh, applicants to just one application, uh, recognizing that, you know, being at a point to be, you know, viable and ready for production is a unique set of circumstances and puzzle pieces. So we don't want to limit uh, folks if they actually do have two viable projects. Um, at the time to come forward. So you can uh, submit more than one application or be uh, attached to more than one application in, in key creative roles. The thing to keep in mind there is that this is still quite limited funds. And so while we're not limiting applications, it could become a consideration during the evaluation process when we think about equ equitable distribution of funds. So really think carefully about, are both of these projects equally ready to go and, and have an opportunity to, to compete at that, at that level? And also, you know, how can you demonstrate through your application that you have the capacity and the skills to sort of simultaneously support two projects if they're successful? And the final question, at least for this segment, uh, does the project need, need to be in English or will you, we consider French projects? An excellent question. Um, excellent question. So yes, we will consider projects in other languages. And, and when I get into the evaluation criteria, we are looking to, you know, again, to reflect that diversity of the pro pro province. And so there are equity points for projects that uh, could be in a primary language other than English. So that might be French, but could also include um, any number of indigenous languages or other, uh, other languages that are spoken and, and reflective of, of the Canada that we live in. There are many more questions, but we will leave them for the next segment. Okay, great. Yes, there'll be, there's lots more to come still. Thank you, Bob. So moving on to our application process. So what's the pathway to success uh, for applications? Step one is to review your full guidelines, FAQ, evaluation criteria, application checklist and submission form. Gather the materials that you need to start your submission. And important, make sure that as the primary applicant, you're being asked to make a self-declaration on behalf of other key creatives in regards to their gender and identity. So we ask you to make sure you're reviewing those questions in advance with your team members, ensure that you're, they're comfortable with you answering them on their behalf, and that you have their consent to do so. So confirm some consent to declare for any other key personnel, and then you'll submit online. So four easy steps, I promise. Painless. Um, so in terms of what is the, uh, the online submission form look like, it's powered by a program called Formstack, which allows us to keep all of your information in one place, and we don't have to deal with, you know, attachments and files hopefully getting lost, um, and, and getting lost in emails and attachments and things like that. A couple of things to note while you're going through, you can stop and save this form at any time, um, and email a copy to yourself, a, a link to yourself, and therefore you can return to the form to make corrections or to come back to it if you need extra time um, before you hit submit on the final page. So you can kind of keep it in a draft stage. 
And the form will notify you when you hit submit if there's a required field that's been left blank. Throughout the application form, you'll see uh, an asterisk next to forms, uh, fields that are required. So definitely, you know, we encourage you to use, check out the application checklist that will help you gather what you need. The checklist will identify, you know, what are required materials, what are some dependent materials or optional materials, and what you may need some, to spend some time preparing in advance or, or that's going to be required as a separate file or code. So what's involved in the uh, application form itself? So in terms of required materials, uh, the information needed is going to fall into a few key areas. The online application form will, will capture standard contact information about the applicant, standard information about the project, and that includes things like genre, length, project type, log line, or, and your description or synopsis. You'll be asked to upload your budget um, and submit your proposed financing structure. Uh, information on yourself and your key personnel, including those all important self declaration questions. A uh, project creative package will be an upload, and an audience and distribution plan will also be a required upload. In terms of dependent materials, uh, this is there's some materials that are dependent on the type of application you're submitting. So they're, they're not listed as required fields, um, but do keep in mind what you're submitting um, to make sure you don't forget them. So for emerging applicants only, we are asking for a personal statement, which is something we've incorporated over the last few um, program, uh, program deadlines. And we've had really good response um, from, especially from our advisory panelists. It really gives a sense of who the person is and will help us in that all important emerging category um, when we're not necessarily looking at the background and track record of somebody. You know, what, is, what's their, what are their motivations? What's their career path? Um, and have that articulated. So the personal statement can be a can be a, a, a word document or a short video under five minutes, um, whichever is your preferred mode to share about yourself. If you do choose a video, we just ask you to upload it to a video sharing site um, and then copy the share URL along with a password if you if you set it to private. Um, copy that into a Word or PDF document and upload it to that section of the form. Um, and again, I can I can help anyone who's maybe getting having troubles with that as we get there. Uh, for our scripted projects, we'll be looking for a complete script for review. For projects that intend to shoot or collaborate with underrepresented communities, we'll be looking for a community engagement plan. And I will talk about that in a bit more detail. Similarly, if you are uh, shooting in those communities, we'll also, if you've already reached out and started that collaboration process, if you have a letter of support from a community representative supporting you or the project, uh, we encourage you to include that now. And then in terms of optional materials, uh, this isn't a really an opportunity to, to show off you and your previous work so you can really get a sense of who you are. So we'll allow uh, links to a demo reel, to teasers, or to previous works, sort of a maximum of two links there. Um, while not required, uh, this is a visual medium. So video links are quite popular with our advisory panelists um, to really, as I say, better understand the artistry of the applicant uh, and their team. Just a quick note that if you do do that, and if you've done teasers or reels made from inspirational footage, um, maybe either try to avoid that, or if that's what you have, that's fine, but just try to clearly mark in the video sort of what's inspiration versus what's actually been shot by the filmmaker, because um, that helps us to, just, you know, to have a look back at the work that they do. And then letters of support, a letter of support. This is, you know, again, who's rooting for you and, and the success of your project. Let someone speak for you through this letter of support. Again, helps the advisory panel men members get a better sense of you and the, and the community behind you. Uh, just looking quickly at budgeting and financing, um, you can use any existing budget template that you're comfortable with that maybe you're already using. That includes the CMF or telephone budget forms, and there's links to those two on our website, um, but can also include um, whatever you're already using, and, you know, things like maybe magic budgeting, if you have a simplified form, you already have an Excel or other documentation that's fine as well. Um, but if you're looking for examples, those are the two that we recommend. Um, and we only require the cop a copy of the top sheet at the time of application, so you don't have to worry about the, you know, the 20 pages of detail. We're just going to be looking at you know, sort of top level spending uh, plans. And again, for those successful recipients, we'll do a deeper dive into your financing and, and budget. The budget you submit should be for your total anticipated production costs, not just your ask of Creative BC. And a reminder that one of the key things that, that is always an easy look for when reviewing applications, please make sure your budget and your financing match. 
Um, so if you have a budget of 500,000, include financing sources, whether they're confirmed or not, that total $500,000. And if you're, you can sort of fall in the camp where you don't have Microsoft Excel, you know, totally understandable. Um, one option for you is you can take the documents that are provided by CMF or Telefilm, you can convert that to a Google Sheet, which is totally free, um, and then modify it there, and then export as an Excel document or PDF. So we actually already talked about this, so yes, you can submit more than one application. So what is a community engagement plan? So a community engagement plan is a newer concept and it stems largely from best practices of, of working within indigenous subject matter and communities as outlined in the on-screen protocols and pathways documentation from the indigenous screen office. And it really embraces the philosophy of if it's about us, it should be by us. Um, so while it will primarily apply to projects that are dealing in indigenous subjects or stories, um, we also see it as an opportunity for applicants to talk about their process of working with any number of underrepresented or vulnerable com communities that might be impacted by their production. Um, so again, this is, a, this is a variable one. It may or may not apply to your project, and that's okay. Um, but appropriate engagement will be highly dependent on the film, the knowledge of the team, the territories or communities that are involved. And it's really there to serve as a tool to help answer questions that are increasingly common during a review period. Um, from our advisory panelists about what the approach of the, of the filmmaker or company is to underrepresented communities and, and potentially sensitive content. So really it's about asking ourselves and asking yourself, have you considered the potential impact of your production and, and, and intend to work in ways that are collaborative and respectful of the communities that your project is about? So it can include any number of things and, you know, involving community members in your creative team, hiring advisors, having counselors on set, hiring local crew, um, or entering into written agreements with those communities. As I say, it's, it's a new process um, that we're looking at adopting. And so if you're not sure if your project needs one, again, please follow up with us and, and we can talk about your situation one-on-one. -on -one. So are there any questions about the application process or um, questions, Bob, that you think are burning that we should address from, from any of the previous sections? If there are, um, there's two questions about timing. Uh, mm -hmm. One is, if Creative BC takes 10 weeks to decide, does the six month funding period start at the time of the awarding of the funding? The six month yeah. clock. Yes, the six month, it's from the date of commitment of your letter and we'll get into that in a bit more detail. But yes, from the date of commitment, um, you'll have six months and we'll talk in a bit more detail about what that, how that threshold works. And I don't know if you'll be able to answer this, but will Telefilm be doing an early round of financing in late fall of 22 or a late 21 round? That's a good question. I can't answer definitively. We have um, been in conversations with Telefilm as we've developed this program and talked to them specifically about what our sort of hope for decision um, timelines are. And they were fairly comfortable that whether for projects that are currently in consideration for Telefilm, they'll hear from us before Telefilm's commitment notes expire, which is great, or for those of, for, for those who receive a, a commitment note from us in the fall, um, they'll be still in a position when Telefilm goes into their next round of, of financing. Next question is on financing requirements. Uh, the question is, do all funding sources listed in the budget need to be confirmed? What happens if one of the pending funding sources does come through, does, does not come through? Should the project lose this Creative BC funding? For sure. So no, at the time of application, uh, your fund, no other financing source has to be confirmed at the time of application. Um, what will happen, and we'll get into it in a bit more detail um, in the next session around uh, section around commitment and contracting, but uh, we will give you a period by which to close your financing um, and, and to replace your financing if financing falls through. And next question is also on financing, uh, but related to tax credits. In regards to tax credits, can the estimate be done by a business affairs EP, or do they need to be certified by an accountant? Uh, I'm going to pass that one to you, Bob. I, <laughs> you can actually, uh, I would say you could do your own estimate. You do not need to have an EP. Don't incur the costs of a certified accountant to do an estimate of your tax credits. Go to our calculator on our webpage do a quick and dirty on that to get an uh, idea of what your tax credits are and uh, just use that tool. If you want to go the extra mile, by all means, but not necessary. 
Right. And I'll just I'll just add on to that because I realize there's one point that I didn't I glossed over. And the type of funding uh, that you'll be receiving from us, this is a grant. So keep in mind that as a grant, uh, it has the potential to grind your tax credit. So that's something that I that you should look into and discuss if you have an accountant or or reach out to the tax credit team uh, at Creative PC to discuss in more detail. Uh, sticking on financing, there is going to be a. Um, do you take into account where the financing comes from? If the majority of the project's financing is coming from the market, i.e., international pre sales, et cetera, as opposed to, say, telephone, would that hurt or help a project? Uh, it's an excellent question. And I think, you know, this is our first round of production financing in, in many years. And I think any confirmed financing speaks to viability. Um, certainly, marketplace support is critical. And that comes up in a couple different ways in our evaluation criteria, not just, you know, what potentially what financing is confirmed and therefore makes the project viable, but also what's the potential appeal and impact uh, within the marketplace. So having commitments that are that are from broadcasters or distributors, um, as opposed to, say, one of the national agencies um, can can certainly help and can show up in a couple different ways in the evaluation criteria. Uh, does crowdfunding campaigns and crowdfunding sources, uh, can, are they considered legitimate sources of funding? Is this is very applicable to ultra low budget movies? Yes, I think certainly in terms of closing financing, um, certainly for um, selected recipients. And, and again, when we get into the, the nitty gritty of how we, we close the financing, um, there, may be, there may be thresholds that something like crowdfunding, it, it doesn't have the same weight as, as sort of a third party financer coming through with, with sort of like cash or check in hand. Um, but certainly in terms of closing overall financing, crowdfunding is certainly welcome. Um, question on community engagement. Are rural communities are, are, are rural communities underrepresented? And so what would a community engagement plan look like given how diffuse rural communities are? There isn't really one community to talk to. Mm -hmm. Well, then I think it comes for me that question comes down a bit to the specificity of who your audience is and who you're making your project for. Um, you know, I previously worked with the National Film Board for many, many years. And one of the things that, that that's really sort of embedded in their in their process, their production process is, is working with communities and rural communities. But it's also about working with specific communities or making projects with specific communities. So it's one thing to say, oh, this is for rural audiences versus this is a project that is of a specific place. And depending on the nature of that place, how closed are they? How isolated are they? What additional considerations if you're, if you're running in um, with a large crew and it's a town of 30 people, what is the impact of that? Um, I did a project several years ago, for example, in a small town called Ocean Falls, um, which is sort of aligned with Bella Bella, sort of the middle of the province. Um, and it's a very small community. And so we there was a lot of work that was done in advance to make sure that they were ready and comfortable for, for the population of the, of the town to basically increase by 50% for, for two weeks. So it's that sort of thinking. Think about the specificity of place and, and versus what a general audience target is and, and whether your project is having an impact um, in rural communities. We've got a few more questions, but if you want to move on to the next section, we can save them for the last part. Sure, sounds good. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit now about the evaluation process and, and decision-making process. So what's, again, the what's the path through evaluation? So we'll start with an initial review um, for completeness and eligibility. So if documentation is missing of those required documents or those dependent documents, um, applications will be informed, applicants will be informed and we'll give you a short period of time, say five days, Kind of submit anything that's outstanding. At the same time, we'll be reviewing against the basic eligibility of the program and determining eligibility within the targeted funding um, targets. Following this, any incomplete or ineligible applications will be withdrawn. Um, so if you don't respond to our notice about incompleteness, um, it, will, it will be considered an incomplete application and it will be removed from consideration. Um, but we will notify all applicants at that time that it's being removed for ineligibility or incompleteness. Um, then the next step is to do a creative evaluation of all the remaining projects, um, and then we'll communicate decisions following that creative review. As mentioned, um, you know, we've, I learned my lesson on my first go around, which was a very heavily subscribed program, um, and I don't want to over promise anything, 
we're looking at at least 10 weeks to sort of turn this deadline, turn this uh, decision around. So we'll be looking to uh, share decisions by early October. So what does that creative um, evaluation look like? So, you know, if I haven't said it before, I'll say it again now, this is a selective and competitive program. Um, we only have a set amount of money to, com to uh, commit. So we'll be taking into account several factors um, and that's all outlined in the evaluation criteria, which you can, you can read in full detail on our website. Um, but this is gonna include things like the background, track record and capacity of the, of the applicants and their key creative team. It's gonna look at the strength and feasibility, the originality and creative quality of, of the project plan and its support creative materials. Um, and we'll look at the viability of the project and its, its appeal and impact with audiences in the marketplace. So the, as I mentioned, I think briefly before, the criteria for emerging applicants as well as ultra low budget projects will be slightly different, reflective of their different needs and their pathways to success. And, uh, and an additional point as well, we're also looking at really doing an intersectional balance of our decision-making process um, that really takes into account a number of equity factors, not necessarily um, those impacted by our target equity groups. Um, so there will be additional points awarded for representation of, of equity seeking groups or sovereignty seeking groups amongst the key creative team members. So that's, you know, beyond the applicant, what's the representation behind the screen and on the screen? Um, so we'll look at an additional, additional points for that. Um, as well, there will be additional points that can be offered for equity factors such as gender, so for women or non-binary applicants, um, and for languages other than English, as we've talked about before, and also regional representation, so for projects that are outside of the Greater Vancouver area. Um, and as I say, there's a, the full breakdown of how we'll look at that is on, is on the site. So how will that, so that create, that's, that's sort of the, the, the content of what we're evaluating uh, on, but how will the, ev the uh, evaluation work? So creative evaluations will be conducted by both Creative BC staff and industry professionals that we bring on uh, onto a series of advisory panels. Um, so two advisory panels will be brought on to help inform the decision, one for scripted content and one for factual content, just say at minimum two advisory panels. We may add more panelists or panels depending on the volume of submissions and the, the type of the complexity of that breakdown. Um, and we all, and that includes the possibility of using shortlist readers um, to help uh, uh, get through the application process. Um, so ad advisory panelists or external readers that we use, as I say, will be industry professionals that represent a cross section of the key demographics of the province, of our industry, and of the targets we're trying to, to hit with this program. Um, so this is something that has, you know, we've been utilizing on the last few uh, selective programs that we've been doing with great success. It's certainly something we continue to hear in consultation groups, that that peer review is a key part of the process, and it's not just about uh, uh, internal reviews here at Creative BC. So once that creative review is complete, um, so for the most part, we, we feel that the decisions should reflect the recommendations that come out of those advisory groups. Um, however, there is, uh, you know, we want to ensure, as I say, an intersectional balance in our decision that really reflects the makeup of our province, that reflects our program goals. And so there may be adjustments to the recommendations before they're finalized. Telefilm, for example, refers to this as portfolio rebalancing, that sort of notion. Um, so we will do that, um, but for the most part, that's something that we're also tasking our advisory panelists with thinking about. Um, and so they've take, really taken that to heart in the processes. So once that, that creative evaluation is done, we will notify all applicants um, by email of their decisions. Um, and unsuccessful applicants, as we mentioned before, you certainly have the opportunity to reapply in the spring. Um, and you also have the option of requesting written feedback on your application um, to support, you know, to help you in that support through the next round. So you've been, you've been selected, congratulations. What happens next? What, what does commitment look like? So before contracting, Creative BC will, uh, will follow up with all successful recipients, complete a detailed business affairs review. This includes chain of title documentation, any confirmed financing agreements that have come in place, um, and updates or changes to the production schedule. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, successful applicants who applied as an individual will need to incorporate an eligible company uh, before contracting. Successful recipients will not move forward to contract until all the project paperwork and financing is locked. 
um, applicants that cannot provide sufficient materials may not be able to move forward to contracting and their commitments may expire. So let's talk a little bit about that financing because you know we, we could come in fairly early on. Initially, what we're offering is that for committed projects, you'll have, an, you'll have six months from the date of commitment to close your financing. If you can't, and that's usually gonna be more affecting to projects that have some financing already in place. If you don't necessarily have a chance to fully close your financing, but for projects that within that six month period can demonstrate at least one additional third party financer comes on board, you'll automatically receive an extension for a further 12 months to close financing. So in that instance, a total of 18 months to close your financing. And any funds from these expired commitments will be rolled into future intake periods. Um, as I say, this is, this is partly a balance about wanting to be open and flexible in the application process, but recognizing that if a project really isn't going to move forward in a, in, you know, in a shorter amount of time, that we allow those funds to be opened up for other applicants. And I know I just barreled through all of that, but we do have six minutes left to handle any last questions. I do. Uh, there's two questions regarding the spring in intake. Mm -hmm. um, if uh, the minimum 10 weeks applies to the spring intake, the 10 weeks to make the decisions, that deadline and the deadline is possibly in April of May of that year, uh, as suggested, that means the decision for the spring will probably take us to late July. That is very correct. possible, yes. And we, you know, I, the, the dates are ultimately to be determined for the spring. We will be keeping a very close eye on other programs and as they announce their program deadlines and what, you know, provides the greatest chance of success um, for our programming to align with other funding sources. Next no, question is also on the spring, on the spring intake. Uh, will they have the same grant limits as this intake? Presumably, yes. I mean, I will say, you know, never say never. This is a pilot program. Um, if there's things that are clearly not working, we may review the guidelines for small changes between now and the spring. But because we're looking at them as really two intakes, I don't see them changing significantly. Um, so we'll, what the, the, the maximum amount will likely be the same. It's just slightly less money available in the spring. Uh, the question, follow-up question is, uh, considering that this is a pilot program, will it, this continue in future years? I certainly uh, hope so. That's, yeah. you know, that's up to all of us together to lobby the provincial government for how necessary and important this and additional funding is. This is, you know, it's really, really, we're really grateful that we have this money to spend um, and to support you all with. Uh, but it need, you know, it'd be great to have more because uh, there's so many, there's so much worthy things that we'd like to do, do to support you all. So um, keep writing to your MLAs. At this point, the uh, provincial government has only committed to this program uh, for for the two years, and as Janine says, that we do hope for success out of this program. And if we can demonstrate success and the community can demonstrate success, uh, hopefully there'll be future funding down the road, but it's not, uh, it's not promised at any point right now. Next question is just on telf uh, sorry, on the readers. Uh, will they be the usual telephone readers? That was the question. Oh, interesting. I mean, I don't know who the usual telephone readers are. Um, I mean, we've, we've done, uh, started to do sort of an exhaustive, uh, not exhaustive, but a, a fairly lengthy reach out to different organizations um, not just telephone or the CMF and, and who they're using, but a number of different organizations, individuals that we personally know that are working professionals here in BC. Um, so we're really trying to get a good cross section of people that are used to the process, people that are maybe not used to the process, but ultimately we're looking for folks that are, you know, as I say, industry professionals, it's about a peer review. Um, so we are looking at that case by case. If, you, if there are folks who have suggestions, we're definitely open to them. So get in touch with me. Um, a question that I missed earlier, and I'm sorry, I just have to go back up to it and just bear with me as I find the question again. So, sorry about this. Uh, the question is why women are not considered in the targeted demographic when they are so badly represented in the film industry? Absolutely, and I appreciate the question. I think for us, this is about that, and that's why we see in the evaluation criteria that we are um, putting some stock into overall representation and additional equity points outside of those targeted groups. This is a very much, yes, women and, and non-binary individuals need to be supported. And we also have crises within other 
um, in other groups uh, of equity seeking groups. So the targeted that sort of that critical uh, the, the crises that's happening right now is about these targeted groups. Um, but in certainly in all of our decisions, we are considering what is our gender makeup. We've looked at, you know, historically over our last few rounds of programming and traditionally gender parity is, um, we're, we're pretty close in our gender parity or we, we're, we're performing slightly above. So we are comfortable that our natural um, balancing um, options and, and the natural strength of projects that are coming to the fore are ensuring that that gender parity is a priority. Uh, two, two more questions to wrap this up. If the creative team is from BC, but 60% of the story happens outside of BC, does it hurt the application? There's no requirement that the story has to happen in British Columbia or in Canada. Um, what we are looking at is obviously about that expenditures and that shooting in the province um, from, a, from an economic point of view. And then from a story and creative point of view, we're, we're looking for projects that are going to be culturally, culturally relevant and that will have appeal and impact to Canadian and international audiences. And as we know, Canadians um, consume content from all over the world. So that it doesn't have to be set in BC in order to be considered a, a BC project. Final question, where can we find your presentation deck and or recording of this webinar? Excellent, last question. Uh, we will be making uh, both the, the, you can, the deck and our recording of this available online um, and probably within about a week, just to give us a bit of time to, to make sure we edit out all of the, the, the early bits where no one's talking. There's more questions, but I don't think we're running out of time. So I apologize that we couldn't get to all of your questions. Um, thank you, Rylan's just dropped in our contact information again. Um, so please don't hesitate if we didn't get to your question and, or it's a particular situation to you or your project, please reach out to us. We're happy to chat over email or to schedule any follow-up calls uh, to take care of that. And that's what we're here for. So please, please take advantage of us. So thank you again for taking time out of your day for being with us today. Um, enjoy the lovely sunshine and the beginning of the, the summer weather. Thanks everyone.